at the time of the end, this is all in the context of the time of the end. It says, times and likes of which never has been and never will be again. Governments, they're all crumbling. Space space weapons platforms, you know, directed energy weapons, you know, it gets into Project Blue Beam, disclosure, soft or hard disclosure. It's all interconnected to the spirit of the age. And so as we deconstruct the deception, well, you gonna stick me in a FEMA camp, homie? Like, dude, wait, you're gonna put me in a FEMA camp? Like, you don't think my God's bigger than your FEMA camp? Tear back every detail about what the global elite are doing, about the occultism, about pre-flood antediluvian stuff, inevitability and imminency of World War III, which is going on right now in real time, even as we're recording this. Um, these things, Jesus said, all these things must take place. That's it, there's no like stupid religion, dude. I hate religion. By the way, listeners, if you hate religion, welcome to the party. And by the way, there's nobody who hates religion more than Jesus Christ himself. This is Jamie Walden and you're watching End Times Productions. What we see going on in real time in our corporate reality is like this, this convergent zenith, for lack of a better word, of all things prophetic, right? From the cultural, to the scientific, to the transhumanism, to the technological, to the geopolitical, geostrategic, um, the cultural wars, right? The, the, the rise of occultism in any and every single aspect of our reality, you know, this hyper spiritualization, even this, even the advent of what we would call panspermia, right? These, these ancient arcane mystery school type of doctrines, these, this religion, this pseudo religion, I don't even want to say pseudo, it's, it's actually a full on hyper spiritual uh, religiosity, but it's all centered on the return of the gods, the golden age of the gods, right? This antediluvian type of reality that we see listed out through scriptures. And so when you combine that with this culmination of Genesis 315, right? I'll put warfare between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, even this genetic cosmic warfare breaking out in real time as I'm uh, dissecting all this and looking at all these things and studying it for the last 15 years, you know, I'd, I would, I would delve deep and delve deep and read and read and read and research. And I'd always go now, but now what Lord, now what Lord, right? That was the question I was always asking. And I'd hear a lot of other people asking too, is like, okay, I'm aware, truly aware of the lateness of the hour. It can be terrifying at times for lack of a better word. Right. It can create all kinds of different natural physiological responses, anxiety, fear, anger, rage, ir irritability. We can tend to want to isolate or we want to lord over, right? It can trigger all kinds of things in our, in our flesh. So as I'm looking at this panorama of truly the lateness of the hour, I kept saying, now what, Lord? Now what, Lord? And then one day in a fast that the Lord really challenged me, he said, you write the now what? You communicate the now what? And I'm like, right, what? <laughs> right to who? Like, I don't even read books. I read articles, right? Like, I don't got time for books. Give me the cliff notes. I'll store the information moving on, right? And I'm like, what? Right, what? Right to who? Who to read it anyway? They have no ambitions to write or anything. And the Lord said, if you show up, I'll show up. That was this dialogue I had. With you. you show up, I'll show up. And I'm like, I, okay, Lord, like, I'll follow you wherever you lead. And and, uh, and, you know, sequestered myself, told my wife and kids, the Lord told me to write a book. I don't know what that means, but I'm leaving until he shows up. And I sequestered myself at a farmhouse and sit down, open my laptop, almost kind of, uh, like irritated at the Lord, right? Like a fool, like so foolish, but, um, I I'm, <laughs> it's just the nature of carnality. Right. And I'm like, okay, I'm here. God, like flip over my laptop, like now what am I supposed to do? And, you know, I'm sitting there like nothing, literally just sitting in front of a word document. And, uh, and I started praying, started praying, started, ended up praying for about an hour. And all of a sudden I, I literally got, got on my knees and was on my face praying. And I stood up cause I couldn't feel my feet anymore. Right. <laughs> sitting on my knees forever. And I sat down on my computer and literally just started writing. Right. Just started, started banging this out and was like, sat there and wrote, this whole book in, in mega dynamics in three weeks, like pretty much one sitting. I went home and visited my wife and kids on the weekend. And then I go back to the farmhouse and be like, here I am again, Lord. And so as you read it is as the Lord, you know, the Holy spirit prompted me to write it. And really what it centers on is our identity in Christ alone as the warrior redeemed. 
And what does it mean to have a knowing of our God? Because we have been foreknown, right? Isaiah 61, like, uh, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness is over the earth, and it is, right? And thick darkness is over the peoples, and it is, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And although this is true, the darkness and the thick darkness is true, I've also said, Daniel eleven thirty two 32, that those who know their God will be strong through the Lord and go forth and do exploits. And that word exploits translates in the Greek to daring feats of valor. And I'm like, how many people, if you ask it, like ask somebody, dude, have you ever done a daring feat of valor? How many people are going to be like, yes, I've done a daring feat of valor. It's like, we have no concept of what that means to, to do an exploit. But the, the peculiarity of the scripture says that those who know, know their God will be strong and go forth and do exploits. At the time of the end, this is all in the context of the time of the end. It says, times the likes of which never has been and never will be again, right? Daniel 12, right? And, and uh, you know, we got Luke 21 and Mark 13 and, and uh, Matthew 24. And then we have 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2 and 2 Timothy 3 and 4 and 2 Peter 3 and 2 Peter 2 and 1 Peter, you know, and it, and it goes this panorama of like, this is what you can't anticipate. It is going to suck straight up. There's no way around it, right? There's there's no way to soften the reality of the time of the end. And obviously, I appreciate all your hard work with End Times Productions, literally like laying it out. This is the panorama of the lateness of the hour. And so now what? Now, now we must have a knowing of our God. And what's interesting about those who know their God, it doesn't say those who are neo-Gnostics that study everything, you know, End Times related. It doesn't say those who are into all kinds of eschatology. It doesn't say those who are hyper-religious, those who are, you know, super duper charismatic and they dance and twirl and spin and speak in tongues everywhere they go. It doesn't say that the designator and the distinguishing factor, which we see all throughout Malachi 3 and, and elsewhere, the distinguishing factor is those who know their God. And so that knowing presupposes an intimacy with the Lord that very few people are walking out. That knowing presupposes a, an unrestrained dying to self and a living for the kingdom of God. That knowing of the Lord actually is the same word used throughout scripture for the intimacy that can only be experienced between a husband and a wife behind closed doors in their bedroom chambers. That's the word knowing that's being used there. It is so intimate. So then you go, how do I grow and anoint the Lord? How do I have an identity that's in Christ and in Christ alone? Because if our identity is in anything else, money, it's coming down. Family, it's coming down. They will betray you and deliver you over to the death, right? If it's in governments, they're all crumbling. If it's in your, your uh, whatever your heroes of this temporal uh, reality are, they're all going to fail you. Everything's going to fail you. Even the church itself is going to fail you. The man of lawlessness cannot be revealed until the great apostasy occurs first. The great falling away from the official faith. Everything is going to fail, except for the Lord says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And like, if we don't have an identity that's rooted in the completed work of Christ alone, everything else is going to overcome you. You will be overcome. You will be deceived because it's, could be possible for the elect, right? If it were possible, Jesus said, when I return, will I even find faith in the land, right? Even some translations say when he returns, there'd be, there, unless he shortened the days, there'd be no flesh left alive. You know, there's different scholarly takes on that that say that that's even talking to the transhumanism, that there would be no flesh that could receive salvation because they're no longer created in the image of God. They're created in the image of those guys, right? So, so this depth goes so far that anything apart from an identity in Christ alone, you will be overcome. But see, the opposite is true in the scriptures. It says that we are those who overcome, to those who overcome, to those who overcome, to those who overcome. Let those with ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying of the churches, right? So even in the book, Omega Dynamics, it's really like it's deconstructing our faulty identity, our faulty self-actualization, right? That's one of the cornerstones of the spirit of the age. The last age is faulty self-actualization. You say you're wealthy and in need of nothing, 
But actually, you never ask God how he sees you. He says, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You're like hot vomit, right? So you say this, but you're, you're self-deceived. You say you're doing these things in my name. I never required you to do that in my name, right? The false teachers, the false prophets, the false leaders, false everything is centered around this, this understanding of the depth of the deception. Yet those who know their God, they're not going to be deceived. In fact, they don't even love their lives so much as they're afraid to lose it. And it's like, how do we get to the point that we don't love our lives so much as we're afraid to lose it? Well, it's the two, the two qualifiers before that. You know the sufficiency of the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And you don't love your life so much as you're afraid. Of. That's what makes you an overcomer. So then it's like, as we deconstruct all these faulty deceptions, this faulty self-actualization, all this cultural garbage, plus the apostasy, plus the this, plus the governments, plus the cultures, plus the occultism, plus the lying signs and wonders, plus the technological things that we can't even comprehend, space-based weapons platforms, you know, directed energy weapons, you know, it gets in a project blue beam, disclosure, soft or hard disclosure, it's all interconnected to the spirit of the age. And so as we deconstruct the deception and we're built back up in the right identity in Christ alone, that's what makes comp that's what comprises the warrior class of the redeemed the warrior class and it's like what is a warrior and why does a warrior do what they do well the lord is a warrior the lord is his name period exodus 15 3. he's like this is who i am and you go how does that work right because but god is love so how is god love and god's a warrior how how do the how could the two go together? Because most people have this connotation of warriors of like a bloodlust, right, or whatever the case is, and it's not true. See, they don't understand what it means to be a warrior. If I if I didn't share with your listeners, I have a background in Marine Corps infantry. So I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps infantry as a war fighter. Took Baghdad back in 03. I worked in law enforcement, both federal with the U.S. Marshals, and then was a local police officer for a while. I served in fire EMS. I was a firefighter paramedic. That was kind of my longest career that I did before I got into doing international disaster relief and some tactical EMS type stuff. And so the concept of a warrior culture is very familiar to me. And as I read through the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, I see the depth and the breadth of a true and better warrior culture under the true and better warrior, God, the father with his son, Christ Jesus, the captain of our salvation, the captain at its head who rides out in justice and judgment to make war, right? Like the son of man was made manifest for this reason that he might destroy the works of the evil one. Oh, I thought he was made manifest to make me feel better about myself. It's not true. Like we have to understand this, right? And when you think about, the reality of uh, of of even these axioms of Christ will realize they're only through the lens of a warrior culture. No greater love is there than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you obey my commands. That is a battlefield, hardcore warrior axiom coined by the true and better warrior, Jesus Christ himself. So it's like, as we grow in an identity of the Lord, and we know that the Lord is a warrior, and yet God is love, we realize that warriors only do what they do because of love. That's why they bleed. That's why they suffer. That's why they sacrifice. That's why they train hard. That's why they go without sleep. They lay down their lives so that others may live exactly what Christ Jesus did for us. And they do it to strike a blow against the enemies of those who they love. They do it to strike a blow against the enemy. So they've counted the cost and they've realized that it is nothing compared to the reward. They've counted the cost and it's not even worth comparing to the commendation that is going to be received. Again, it's all the entire gospel is martial language. It is to your commendation. Well, what's a commendation? That's a military medal pinned upon your chest. It's literally a commendation. It's to your commendation if you suffer unjustly because you're conscious of Christ. It's to your commendation if you do this. It's your commendation if you do that. So a knowing of our Lord, a knowing of the true and better warrior King Jesus, he, he was a suffering servant, Messiah ben Joseph. But the next time we see him, we will see him as he truly is, Messiah ben David the coming conquering king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who rides out in justice and judgment to make war. Why? Because of love. 
true, better love, like a love that we don't understand. So, so when you actually like understand the mission set of the father, and then you understand the mission set of Christ, then you can actually start to begin your mission set. And when you understand an identity that's rooted in Christ alone, nothing in this world will shake it. Psalm 112, right? We're not of those who fear bad news. We're not easily shaken. Our hearts are steadfast, trust in the Lord. Our hearts are secure. We have no fear. It's not the spirit he's given us. He's given us a spirit of warriors. Not a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a soundness of mind. Listen, I've given you all spiritual gifts in the heavenly realms. Listen, I've given you all power to tread on the lions and the serpents and the scorpions and over all the powers of darkness and nothing by any means will harm me. Listen, a vanquished foe, a disarmed enemy, trans triumphed over them at the cross. Do you not know who you are? And when you when you look at the gospel through that lens, not the gospel, the Old and New Testament, God's constantly saying from Abraham and and then it, well, into Enoch and into Noah and into Abraham and on through Moses and the Israelites delivering them and and then all their failings in the wilderness and then their failings and and supposed supposed to be a a city on a hill that everybody emulates and then into the church and the apostasy into the church and the whole time God's constantly going. Don't you know who you are? Look at the ring on your finger. Look at the cloak on your back. You have a new family name. You have been adopted into this family. You're no longer sons of disobedience. You're no longer of your father, the devil. You are now an heir and a co-heir with Christ Jesus. Don't you know who you are? Act like it. And that's the thing is like, act like it. And if you notice all throughout scriptures, especially the New Testament, all the epistles and the gospels is... They're constantly trying to call up the believers into their identity. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know who you act like it? Don't you know the family name that you bear? Act like it. So our cowardice says that God is not good and Christ is not sufficient. Who's the first ones God cast in a lake of fire? The cowards, right? Our double-mindedness shows that we don't understand the sufficiency of Christ and the power of Christ and the sufficiency of the Spirit in us. Our fearfulness, because we love the world and the things of the world, is revealing of what's actually going on in our heart, right? And our inability to stand or to act or to be willing to lay down our lives shows that we don't understand that it has been bought and paid for with something precious and imperishable, the blood of Christ. We don't understand the resurrection. We don't understand the hope of glory. We don't understand it, so we fear, so we cling, so we protect, so we self-preserve, We self -preserve, right? We self-esteem, we self-exalt, we self-protect, self-self. They will be lovers of selves. They'll be lovers of self. They'll be lovers of pleasure. What's pleasurable to you? Hear no evil, see no, see no evil, don't want to deal with that, you know, or I want to sit on a couch and be apathetic and complacent, or I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be mocked, scoffed, reviled, persecuted for the cause of Christ. I love pleasure rather than God. See, they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's a usurpation. It's a cosmic usurpation. And so, like my burden, even with the book Omega Dynamics, is that we would know unequivocally our identity in Christ. Because when we do, it's like, bro, we, well, you're going to stick me in a FEMA camp, homie? Like, dude, wait, you're going to put me in a FEMA camp? Like, you don't think my God's bigger than your FEMA camp? And by the way, you can't take your life from me. You know that, right? Like, th see, this is the, <laughs> I go on tangents, right? I'm rabbit brain, but like, if you knew your identity in Christ, we should carry ourselves with a degree of an invincibility complex. Not out of pride or hubris or self-aggrandizement or, or whatever, faulty self-actualization, but an invincibility complex that is so secure because of humility and contrition. It's so secure in Christ that nothing would ever rock you. It's like, you, you can't take my life from me. You can't. All the beast system, all the machinations of the global Leo, they can not take your life from you. It's bought and paid for. It's bought and paid for. It is so secure in Christ Jesus that it's his to will according to what he would do with it. Lord, if he wants to lay it down by the sword, he'll lay it down by the sword. If he wants to lay it down in prison, he'll lay it down by prison. If he wants to lay it down with astral catastrophism and, you know, debris from Apophis coming in in 2029 to fall on your house. Praise God, dude. Like, heck yeah. Like, please drop a nuke on me and my family. Because all I know is I'll be chilling. And then I'm in glory. 
Like no con like no fear in life or no no uh now and I can't remember the the words to in Christ alone. What's it like uh no fear in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me from life's for cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. And so, dude, the ones who will overcome all of it, all the machinations of Lucifer and a third of his rebels, this insurgency, this cosmic insurgency, and all their their um their alliances with men and wicked men and wicked institutions and and all their technologies and all their genetic manipulations that they're trying to do as open warfare against the holy God, all of it will come to nothing to those who know their God. And see, if you haven't noticed, the biggest threat everywhere in the world is an authentic, choose my words carefully, an authentic Christian. They can't be controlled. They can't be strong-armed. They can't be starved. They can't be persecuted. They can't be beheaded. You cannot quench the Spirit's fire in an authentic believer. They do not care. In fact, they will preach the gospel to you as you're putting them to the sword. And this is what it looks like to overcome. And so, unfortunately, what we have in our generation, especially because of the, I call it neo-Gnosticism, right? It's just a stupid word I made up, but um, the neo-Gnosticism is all about study, 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 study. We tear back every detail about what the global elite are doing, about the occultism, about pre-flood antediluvian stuff. I do too, right? And and so so we we dig and we dig and we study and we study and we study. But again, in prophetic fulfillment. We're always learning, but never able to come to an understanding of the truth. See, there's a component missing. And the truth is the person and the deity of the Godhead through Christ Jesus to the Father and the Holy Spirit. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. And that's the component that everybody misses. So they go, more information, more information, more information, more information. And their spirits are a mess and their hearts are a mess and they're weighted with every kind of anxiety and dissipation so that that day comes upon them while they're unaware. It's all prophetic fulfillment in real time among the truther movement, dude. Like I'm like, the truther movement is the most susceptible to the deception of the time of the end than any other group out there because of hubris and faulty self-actualization. They think they got it figured out. And it's like the only thing you need to have figured out is, is Christ enough? Is the love of God made known to you already past tense? Has past tense now been made known to you in Christ? Romans 8, that nothing can separate you from his love, nor light, nor diet, nor angel, nor demon, no, nothing in all of creation, all of creation. That means the celestial rebels, they're created, nothing can separate you from the love of God that has been made known to you, Christ Jesus. Do you know that? And do you understand that? Because that is the only thing that's going to distinguish and separate those who overcome from those who are, are overcome. The number one indicator of lateness of the hour is the spirit of the age. It's not the astral catastrophism. It's not the earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars. It's not the inevitability and imminency of World War III, which is going on right now in real time, even as we're recording this. Um, these things, Jesus said, all these things must take place. But then what did he say? See to it that you do not lose heart. Oh, and by the way, when you begin to see these things taking place, Luke 21, stand up and look up for your redemption draws nigh. It's like there's a mission set embedded within all the signs of the times. There's a very particular mission set that we miss. Why? Because we don't know our God. We like him. We like salvation. We like not hell, right? We like some more moral moralism that comes with it, right? We like these things, but do you know your God? See, that's the distinction that has to be made. And it requires an it requires a mortification of the flesh and of self that very few people are willing to enter into. It requires a literally it, like the scriptures say, like your flesh, you murder it. 
Like it is so gnarly. It is so vile. And the powers of darkness are preying on it and poking on it and prodding it and exposing it. And then our natural inclination is so hardwired for rebellion against God. It is so, the, the battlefield is so savage and the fog of war is so thick that literally the only thing it tells you to do is you must murder the flesh, crucify it. That's a first century torture device. That's the only way that it ha that it can be dealt with. So like, that's high stakes, right? That's like requires like, oh God, like King David said, like, search my heart, Lord, see if there's any unclean thing in me and leave me in your way everlasting, right? Or like the sin of Achan in Joshua 7, where God's like, bros, paraphrasing, <laughs> super paraphrasing, right? Gents, <laughs> listen up, gents. Somebody has something unclean hidden in their camp. And what's he tell them? Joshua 7, you have been made liable for destruction on the field of battle. You will be conquered when you march out to war because there's something unclean in your camp. He says, he commands them. He goes by, by tribe, then by clan, but then by family. And then man by man, he says, remove the unclean thing from your camp because you have been made liable by me for destruction on a field of battle that you don't understand. And so when you look at the signification of the reality of what it looks like to truly walk with our God, carnal, we're carnal, we're messy, right? Hot mess, we're all hot mess. But even in that, you can walk in a knowing of your God, like David or like the apostle Paul, who's like, dude, I'm chief among sinners, bro. Like, for real? Dude, flesh, spirit, worn, man. Like, like I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. Oh, I'm such a wretch. I'm chief among sinners. And yet in the same breath, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? David, it's like, oh, adulterer, murderer, uh, haughty, right? He, 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 he gets puffed up. And he starts taking glory from himself, then from God. And he experiences the consequences of it. Yet God goes, that man, that's a man after my own heart. How, how could the two be true at the same time, right? These carnal hot messes yet be men who know their God? It's because they knew the sufficiency of God's love and grace and the riches of his mercy. When, when David confessed his sins to the Lord, adulterer, murder, haughty, he knew his God. He said, though my sins were as crimson, you made them white as snow. Oh, he knew his God. And God goes, see, that's a man who gets me. He know when I forgive, it's a done deal. When I grace, it's a done deal. When I mercy, it's a done deal. And when I judge, it's just. They knew their God. So they knew even in spite of my failings, in spite of my double-mindedness, in spite of my war, flesh and spirit warring, what I know is Christ alone and Christ alone. Christ, the armor of God, the armor of God. Is Jesus himself on you? Like, everybody tracking. Everybody tracking who's listening to this, right? The armor of God is Christ alone. It is the armor of God, not the armor of Saul that didn't fit David. It's God's literal armor, and it's Jesus himself. He, he is the helmet of salvation. He is the faithful one. His faithfulness is your shield and rampart. He is your righteousness. You have none of your own. Good luck with that, right? He is the truth, your war belt that skirt around your waist that has your primary kit for striking a blow against the enemy, right? He is the peace where once you were an enemy with God, now he's the peace that shods your feet so you won't turn your ankle in the scrum of the field of battle. It's Christ. He is the sword. He says, take it. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Take the sword. Christ Jesus is the sword, the word, double edge, only one purpose for making war is for cutting off the flesh and striking a blow from within and a blow from without against the powers of darkness. It's like, dude, we got to get this. Like the lost and dying world needs us to get this. The church needs us to get this. The body of Christ needs to get this. And the glory of God demands it of us. So that's why it's like, where, where can you go? I mean, dude, like, yeah, we can lay out, like lay out all the, all the signs of the lateness of the hour. Like I'm well adept at that. Like, that's like, I love studying that stuff. It has all kinds of relevancy and power and weight, but the true and better weight isn't that. The true and better weight isn't a knowing of all the latest, greatest intel. The true and better weight is a knowing of your God. Cause I don't care about your age. 
I don't care about your infirmity. I don't care about your past failings. I don't care about your woundings. I don't care about the broken record of self-condemnation you've heard in your head your whole life. I don't care about your family of origin. I don't care about your socioeconomics. I don't care anything about that. I go, bro, sister, do you know your God? The 89-year-old sister, do you know your God? You will be the mightiest warrior on the field of battle. You will be like David's mighty men of valor. And you by yourself will slay 3,000 in the spirit. And it's like you, wounded young woman, because somebody forced their body against your body, against your will and their carnality. And it's been the enemy's been using it to chew you up and chew you up and chew you up and chew you up. But you know your God. You know he loves you. You know he never left you or forsake you. Even in that worst moment of your life, you know your God. You and all your woundings and all your brokenness, you who know your God, you're going to be strong. And you will go forth and do daring feats of valor. All these religious pontificators, all these freaking puppeteers in the pulpits, all these emotionally predatory wolves out there doing what they do. Cannon fodder, dude. Cannon fodder. It's those who know their God. And so that's the distinguishment that we must get in this late hour. It's the hope of the resurrection. It's the hope of the glory. We set our eyes not on what is unseen for what is for what it or what is seen for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We look at these, they, they're called light and momentary afflictions. They don't feel light and they don't feel momentary. Anybody, we all have all kinds of woundings and things pulling on us in our lives. They don't feel light and momentary, but in the scheme of eternity, in the scheme of the resurrection, in the scheme of the hope of glory, it's like light and momentary. That even worth comparing. Like, don't even, like, now that we're comparing to the glory is going to be revealed, right? So it's like, it does seem hopeless if your eyes are fixed on this world. If your eyes are on this world and the things of the world says, anybody who loves the world are the things of the world. Sorry, the love of the Father is not in you. It can't be because we are not, we're not, this world, it says, this world's not even worthy of us, right? Hebrews 11, like, not even worthy of us. And it's like, this isn't my home. I'm an ambassador of a nation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a people of his own. I'm an ambassador of a kingdom, not yet. I'm an ambassador of, a, of an eternal kingdom that will never be shaken. I'm an ambassador of that. I'm not an, I'm not a, an American, right? And people are like, oh, you know, constitution republicist. It's a fun, fun word I made up, right? Like rah, 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 you know, all this stuff. I'm like, homie, I'm not like, dude, I'm a I'm as patriotic as the next guy, but bro, I'm not about a constitutional republic. I'm a monarchist. I believe in a king and a kingdom. I serve a king and a kingdom, and I serve in his courts, and I'm an ambassador. This is not my home. Heck yeah, this is hopeless. Dude, you better believe this is hopeless, right? Like, what in the world would I be kicking and clawing and screaming and retain in this life? I know what's coming for me. It's a beyond comprehension. So I go, that's why I have hope. That's why I count it a pure joy when I face manifold, diverse trials. That's why I can rejoice in suffering. That's why I can count it a joy to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. Because it says, if you die with Christ, you'll also be raised to life with them. And it's like, so that even this context, right, our omega dynamics, it even shapes how you suffer. You don't suffer as one who goes about with no hope. That's for, that's for the pagans. That's for the unbelieving world. But those who know their God, they don't suffer as those who have no hope. It's not fun. It's never going to be fun. You're not going to go, yay, thank goodness I get to take on this suffering beyond comprehension. But you go, it's nothing compared to what's coming. It's nothing compared to what's coming. My king has already conquered it all. And he's coming soon. And he's going to make all things new all things new. And it says, and never will I go out from his rest. Never will I go out from his joy. All tears wiped away. No more pain, no more suffering, new heaven, new earth. And it says, as Christ overcame and sat with the father at the right hand, so you too, when you overcome, you will sit with him at the right hand of the father. Like insane, right? Insane. 
to those who overcome. Reread them if you haven't. Like, listen, like, reread them, right? Or, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, to those who overcome, to those who overcome, to those who overcome, to those who overcome, and sit there and meditate. Not new age. Don't even try to send me nasty grams because I said that. Meditate legitimately, authentically on what God is saying to those who overcome and read what he says. What he speaks over his people is beyond comprehension. What he speaks over his people is what a warrior king speaks over his warrior culture. This is who you are. This is who you are. These are the ethos. This is our code of conduct. This is what we represent. This is who we are, period. Now act like it. The bottom line is like strip all religiosity away from it. Like the Lord's sole purpose for humanity from the garden onward was to be fully known and fully glorified. There's that word again, known. To be fully known and fully glorified. The Lord is not hiding himself from anybody. He says in Romans 1, like, I've made myself plain, even through creation. I mean, we're in the Rocky Mountains, right? Like, And like, there's mountains in the background. I don't know if they're showing up on camera or whatever. And it's like, the Lord's like, I want to be known and be glorified. I am not shifty like a shadow. I'm not deceptive. I am patient with all of humanity, not wanting any to perish, but all to have everlasting life. Some, no matter how much I come to bring peace, they just choose to make war no matter what. And so all that to say is like, just take all the religiosity away from it, all the church ingrained things, even the cultural, even if you've never been in a church, we still have our preconceptions of Christianity because of culture. Strip it all away. It's so simple. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. Like, reveal yourself to me, God. I want, I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. I want you to be my father. I want you to be my king. I want you to be my friend. God, like, just take this life and reveal yourself to me. And he's like, done because that's what we do oh son daughter like yes yes and like all the heavens like you know like rejoicing right like heavenly hosts are like that's it that's it there's no like stupid religion dude i hate religion by the way listeners if you hate religion welcome to the party and by the way there's nobody who hates religion more than jesus christ himself because religion is what kept everybody from knowing the Father. And religion is what killed him. And religion is what he came to tear down. So it ain't about religion. It's about the God of all creation who knowingly pursues us with intimacy, obsession from authentic love as a warrior. He fights, he protects, he defends, he makes war. Why? Because of love, authentic love. And he's shown the lengths to which he's willing to go. That's the key. He's already shown the lengths to which he's willing to go for you. That while you were his enemy, Christ died for you. How much more if he calls you friend, our son, our daughter? If you confess with your mouth, it's like, just speak it. Sometimes that feels awkward for people. You'd be surprised. Like to say something out loud, they're like, uh, they're, even if they're by themselves, they feel awkward about talking out loud. It's like literally like, Lord, I want you. I don't even know where to start. How's that for a start? Lord, I want you and I don't even know where to start. And watch what happens. Watch what he does. Watch who he brings into your life, who he leads you to, what he leads you to. Call me. We don't care. Like we have a mission set. This is what this is all about. Our Omega Dynamics, right? We have a mission set right now and it is a great harvest and it's to bring many sons and daughters to glory. It is to bind up the brokenhearted. It's to strike a blow against the powers of darkness. It's to tear down every false pretense and stronghold that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's to redeem the time because the days are evil and it is to bring people and usher them in to just the beauty and majesty of the love of God for them that he's shown them through Christ Jesus. It's so simple. It's so simple. Not easy. It's simple though. It's just not easy, right? So yeah, I mean, the start is like, there's there's no algorithm. It's Lord, I, do, you got to drop some F-bombs in there while you're praying? <laughs> the Lord is more than able to take it. Wherever you're at, I'm like, dude, where are you at? Operate where you're at. Like, God, I'm a hot mess, man. I don't know what's going on. God, I'm kind of angry. 
because like I've experienced this in my life and I'm very distrusting of you, but I want to know you. Our Lord, like I had a really bad father. So to think of you as a father, it stirs something in me and I don't like, and I have an aversion to you. But God, I want to know you. Lord, I, I was in religion. I was raised in the church and it was religious. And my parents were total hypocrites and my pastors were total hypocrites. And the people in the church were total hypocrites. And I don't want anything to do with this thing. But I want you. And it's like, wherever you're at, man, you just, dude, lay it out. Like he wants to be known and he wants to be glorified. There is nothing, nothing, nothing in this life that you have done, that you are doing, or maybe you haven't even had your worst moment yet. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus. It says literally in all of creation, guess what you are? <laughs> You're a part of creation. Like, like you can't if, there's a big if, circle it, if you confess and if you repent. He's like, done. Far as the east is from the west. You're like, but God, I'm this, but God, I'm that, God, I'm this, God, I'm that, God, I'm not this, I'm not that. I wish I was this, I wish I was that. And he's going like, what are you talking about? Like when, like, it's, I don't see anything on you, but my son. And that's what people don't understand. It's like, it's not your righteousness. He's like, my son, I see my son on you. Remember the armor of God? I see his righteousness. I see his holiness. I see his blamelessness. I see his faithfulness. Praise God, it's not up to our faithfulness. Could you imagine, dude? 10 times out of 10, we would blow it. It's like, no, his faithfulness to you is your shield and rampart. And so there is no distance that you could have created in your life, or maybe somebody else's sinful will imposed against you that can separate you from God. I, I know former Satanists. I know occultists. I know witches covens. I know pedophiles. I know adulterers. I know womanizers. I know God haters. I know haughty. I know the proud. I know the victim, you know, victim mentality person their whole life. I know them all. And I know all of them as radiant in Christ Jesus. Now that's not who they are. That's what they did. Who they are in Christ through confession and repentance is now there are some of those like God. And so there's literally nothing that can separate you from the love of God. If, if you confess, if you confess, he says he's faithful and just to heal you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Doesn't matter what, what clothes you are wearing or were wearing, he dresses you in white raiments, pure, like a, like a virgin unveiled on her wedding day, you know? So dude, that's why I'm like, I hate religion, man. Did I get so ticked off about religion because it keeps people from knowing God. They say, get clean and then you'll be acceptable to, before the Lord. And the Lord's like, what did they just say? Are they serious? They told you that? Like, that's not how we roll. Look at my word. Read my word. Eat my word. Look at my son. That's not how we roll. And we've just, so many people have missed it because of the garbage of life and the enemy saying, you're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. You're not clean. You're not clean. You're not clean. You're unworthy. You're worthless. You're this, you're that you've done this. You've done that. It's the enemy whispering in the ear. And yet God says, all unrighteousness, shut your freaking mouth. All unrighteousness will shut its mouth, period. And sometimes I've had to scream that out in my room. So I get a little animated. Right. And it's like, where well, I'm like, I'm, we're all just as susceptible to it, right? The deceptions and the taunts of the enemy and, and all this stuff. And it's like, then I remember like, wait a minute, dude, I'm a son of the king. I know, I know who I am. How about you unrighteousness? How about you shut your mouth in the name of Jesus? And then I move on, right? Moving on with my day. We get to go. Okay, I'm going that way. People want to try to pigeonhole repentance and again, make it algorithmic. They always try to make everything about God algorithmic. Instead of reducing it to a childlike faith, it's like the Lord has no higher expectation on us than what you would have on a three-year-old. How, how many, how much expectation do you put on a three-year-old? Not a whole lot, right? So even in our, in our childlike, it, well, in our hubris or in our desire to self-validate or to self-righteous or to self-save or whatever, um, we still even repentance. We try to make it algorithmic when really it's like, Lord, I don't want that. God, uh, forgive me. I'm sorry. Like, I don't want that in my life because 
I know the destruction that it brings. I know the consequences of it. I know that it creates, it alienates me in relationships. It destroys relationships. I know that, that it's been a burn to my marriage and then now down onto my kids. Like I see, I see the con consequences of it, God. And as I come to understand you more, I realize that really I'm not warring against anybody else. I'm actually making war against you, Lord. And I love you. I don't want to do that. And it's like, so simple, so simple. And that, like, I'm repenting, Lord. I'm repenting. Oh, but I did it again tomorrow. Then you repent again tomorrow. Like, right? It's not like a one and done repentance. Like, it's it's progressive sanctification. It's constantly in communion with your God, just like with the spouse, right? And maybe this is a hard, hard uh, analogy for a lot of people because they have really crappy marriages. Right. And usually they have really crappy marriages because they're selfish. They're lovers of self. They are not of a warrior spirit. They won't lay down their life for the other spouse. They won't suffer for them. They won't take abuse for them. They won't be willing to be wronged by them because they don't authentically love them. They love themselves more than they love their spouse. In a spousal relationship, it's about communion as you walk together. As you do life, you're communicating and you're sharing in things and you're, you have bad days and you have good days and you have high days and you have low days and you have days where you totally blow it and you have to come in and say, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know where that came from. I'm overwhelmed and my flesh, you know, I fire hosed you with stuff or whatever. And it's like, then you have days where you're tender and your compassion is just rich intimacy. And it's the same thing with the Lord, like literally with the Lord, because he refers to himself as our bridegroom and we're the bride and he pursues us and he pursues us and he pursues us. Why? For the intimacy, the intimacy for that knowing, that very knowing that distinguishes those who are overcome from those who will be overcome. That's why the intimacy is there because life comes at you. The enemy comes at you and the flesh is strong. And like, we have to preach the truth. It's the truth that sets people free, not friendliness. Not moralism, not Gnosticism, not knowledge. The truth. And the truth is, this is who I am in Christ. This is who I am in Christ. This is who Christ is to the Father. This is who the Father is, is to the Son. And then the Father and Son said, we got a mission said, let's go die and suffer for them while they're at war against us. Because this is to our glory like to understand this. And it says, if Jesus prays as he's getting ready to go to the cross before he gets arrested in Gethsemane. And he says, he says, Father, I pray for them that their love would be complete as you and I have loved one another. Can you, like, can you fathom that? As the father and the son have loved one another, it's like, that's the love I want to have for them. And then think about this, dude. Like, think about the love of the father and the love of the son and the love of the son and the love of the father and, and the Trinity and the Holy Spirit, right? And they're, they're, whatever, there's no time constraints, right? These, this eternal reality. And they have these celestial beings already around them, glorifying them and worshiping them, right? And then a third of them rebel. And they're like, dude, we so want to be known and be glorified. And like, we we're so complete in this love relationship. We, we don't need to create humanity. We don't, they were contented, but they chose to. Why? So that we could share in that with them. And he says, that's what I want them to know and understand. Oh, by the way, father to son, son to father, this love. And he goes, you, a love we can't even fathom, this love that, that uh, think of it, even an earthly father to his son. And he says, son, go die for ISIS. You're getting ready to have a son. He said, son, I love you. Like, Oh, just the love. You can't even explain it. And you go, son, go die for, go die for the enemies of our household. Die for them. Like this is the love that people don't understand because it's been reduced. It's been maligned. It's been corrupted. It's been perverted. It's been tainted. The enemy steals, snatches away these basic truths, snatches away these truths from our hearing and just grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds. And the whole uh, crescendo of the spirit of the, of the age of the end times is a grinding action. It says he will grind the saints. He will make war against the saints and wear them out. It's a grinding action so that you'll never come to an understanding of who you are to Christians. That's the name of the game. That's, this is cosmic warfare. 
This is Genesis 3 warfare. This is Genesis 6 warfare. This is Genesis 18 warfare. This is warfare in Gethsemane. This is warfare at Calvary. This is warfare, warfare, warfare. It is cosmic warfare that we have been written right into it from a position of victory. Not trying to claw towards victory. That's religion. We fight from a position of victory. It says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises a standard against them. Again, it's all martial. That is a battle flag, a guide on an ensign on a battlefield. He's like, the enemy's coming. Boom. He puts the fight. He's like, follow me in the battle, right? Like you charge headlong in battle. He's like, rally the troops. Like, Rah! right. And you get in the fight. And then he's like, he's like, victory. Boom. Plants the flag, right? On the, on the, on the, on the, on the Mount of Olives. Transfiguration, resurrection. Oh, and by the way, I'm returning there too one day. Flag planted, victory. And he's like, so again, when we have a knowing of our God, doesn't mean you don't get your butt kicked. It's war, cosmic war spilling over to the natural. War presupposes suffering. It presupposes perseverance. It presupposes endurance. It presupposes loss. It presupposes mourning. It presupposes all kinds of things. I've been a war fighter. There's nothing pleasant about it. Oh, but how sweet the victory is. How sweet the victory is. And how sweet the day was when my platoon commander came and pinned a medal upon my chest for valor in the face of overwhelming odds and keeping with the ethos of the Marine Corps. And our true and better captain of our salvation will pin that commendation upon our chest for valor on a field of battle and keeping with the ethos of his kingdom. So even people who are maybe awake to, to how lateness, how, to how lateness, that's not even a word, to the lateness of the hour, right? Like even people that are awake to that, they're filled with anxieties because of it. Wrong. You're wrong. Period. Or dissipations. What's dissipations? That's the opposite side of the house. That's frivolity. That's frivolous living. That's prodigal living, licentious, lavish living. So it says, do not be overcome by these anxieties or these so that that day comes upon you while you're unaware. You ought to know that you have a mission set in Christ. And it's good, a good mission set. It's filled with exploits, daring feats of valor, uh, turning many back to righteousness, as it says in Daniel 12. It's to the tearing down of strongholds. It is mighty, not weak. We have a mission set. And if you think you were born in the wrong generation, you're wrong. You're wrong. But I'll tell you this, as Mordecai admonished Esther, right? If you remain silent this time, deliverance for the Jews will come through somebody else. So you get to choose. You get to choose like the 34,000 with Gideon. You get to choose to go, ooh, I don't know. The cost is a little too high. And he goes, if anybody's fearful or faint-hearted, get off the battlefield. Go home. Go home. If you want that and you love that, go home. But for the 300 that are so hypervigilant for my glory that they pull the water to their mouths because they're looking for the enemy and they're looking for the fight, even in the rear with the gear, to those 300, they get to come watch me work. Like that's your reward is you get to watch God work. You get to watch him snatch people from the fire. You get to watch him take, uh, you know, somebody who has this horrible, perverse lifestyle and make them totally new and transform their mind. You get to see somebody who's been chewed up their whole life with woundings as an 80 year old woman who hates herself. Her whole life's been filled with self-loathing and then all of a sudden be radiant because she understands her identity in Christ. You get to watch that. That's your reward. But if you remain silent at this time, Lord will pick somebody else. Deliverance for the Jews will come from somebody else. And you and your household will suffer for it. This is the admonishment of Mordecai and Esther. But how do you know? How do you know if you haven't come to this royal position, a royal priesthood, a holy nation? How do you know if you haven't come to a royal position for such a time as this? Dude, that's the mission set, man. That's the mission set. If anybody's interested in, in um, you know, reading the book or contacting me or following the ministry or whatever, you can uh, find the book on Amazon. Don't be haters, okay? All the Christian publishers would not touch my book with a 10-foot pole because it talks about authentic walk. So 
I, <laughs> Amazon's the only person that would carry it. So you can find my book on Amazon. It's Omega Dynamics, Equipping a Warrior Class of Christians for the Days Ahead. There's also like a companion study guide that goes along with it because it really is pretty like deep of deconstructing and then building us back up in the right image of God. Uh, you can get a hold of me at omegadynamics.org. That's omegadynamics.org. Uh, you can find me on YouTube or Rumble as long as I'm there under Jamie Walden. Uh, lots of sermons and different, you know, current event stuff that we speak to and talk about. Um, have a uh, uh, potentially a network TV show that's coming out soon. I've been working on a project with Tim Alvarino and Gary Haven uh, for a couple of years now, and that should be coming out. And then you can also uh, find us at calicobuffalobasecamp.com. So we're currently operating a camp here in Colorado uh, where we're training the redeemed of the Lord to be resilient spiritually, emotionally, and physically uh, for the days ahead. So, yep, that's where you can find me. Now.